that and I'm chairing this evening's meeting. We have people in the room here. We also have people online. Uh, so just do bear that in mind, there are people listening. So when you're talking, can you please make sure you turn on and speak into the microphone uh, that's either on your table or nearby to your table. Uh, for those in the room, some very quick housekeeping points. The emergency ex it's gone off. I'm like, oh, no, there it is. Uh, corner of the assembly room, uh, of the room. Assembly point is over there in the, in the corner and the assembly point is in the car park. Uh, the toilets are at the end of the corridor on the right and there's an accessible toilet to the right of the lift, tea and coffee and refreshments over there. Uh, Paul Wynn is clerking this evening. Laura, Sarah and Rachel will manage the questions on the board um, and the general IT, although I'm them for when my going off. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Um, we are recording this meeting and also streaming it live to our YouTube channel. Uh, for those councillors on Zoom, please use your yellow hand uh, on your screen for asking questions and for everyone else, raise your actual. Um, first on the agenda is a question for and we have apologies from Mel and Ben, is that right? Mel's on, oh, Mel's on screen. Uh, ben. So, so Ben, Ben, uh, I've forgotten Ben's surname. Still, Still, Still has sent his apologies. Mel's on screen, but technically he has sent his apologies because he's not present today. So it's a technicality. Okay. Can we vote to accept those apologies? Uh, proposer Fiona, seconder Andy Rintmore, everyone in favour of that? Raise your red flag. Thank you very much. That's, that's unanimous, I think. Is there anyone voting against approving those apologies? Polly's, no. <laughs> you're in. Uh, do we have any declarations of councillors interests this evening? Yeah, Andy Jones, uh, I'm a director of SOS Froom, so I do have an interest in uh, item six, but with your permission, I'll remain in the room so that I can answer any relevant questions. Votes. Correct. Correct. I can feel that this is going on and off, so I'm sorry if that's annoying. I don't really know how to fix it. Is that, yes, that's probably better if that's okay. Um, so we first of all need to approve the minutes from the last meeting. I'll just go quickly through page by page. If there's anything that stood out to anyone, any questions on page one, two, three, four, five, or six of the last minutes. Can somebody vote to approve those for us, please? Nick Dove, somebody second, Philip Campagna, and all those in favor of approving the last minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> higher, higher. <laughs> That's unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've made a slight change to the agenda this evening in that I'm shifting point three up to uh, to be the next item on the agenda. Uh, so that is questions and comments from the public and councillors. <clears throat> Do we have any? Nick. Uh, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Nick Dove. I'm a town councillor for Keyford Ward. Um, I'm also a lead councillor for the town centre. And um, I guess just about everyone in the room will be aware that um, there is a large site in Froome called Saxonvale. There's been the subject of lots of discussion and debate over the last few years. Um, a campaign was launched called Mayday Saxonvale, which has um, really caught the public's imagination and interest. And is, as I understand it, one of the most supported planning applications that has ever been had, certainly on the Mendip uh, portal. And there was great celebration in the town when. Um, the planning application from Mayday was actually accepted at a meeting by Mendip District Council um, earlier this year. However, since then, um, there has been a rather bewildering, I guess, stagnation in terms of what seems to have happened since then. And I find it really hard to explain to people what's happening. Um, I find... Um, delay and what seems to be a, a, a series of obstacles put in the way of Mayday proceeding with their application um, inexplicable. So we asked, um, we invited the uh, Mendip District Council Planning Board to come to the meeting today so we could ask them some questions. 
but unfortunately they weren't able to come. So I have three questions I would like to ask. And I'm also aware that we're lucky enough to have um, district councillors from Mendip in the room. And I think also one at least unitary councillor in the room. So perhaps they can listen to the questions and perhaps help answer them. No pressure, Mr. Clark, Mr. Dimery. So <laughs> my three questions. Can Mendip District Council confirm why they are not agreeing to participate in May Day's Section 106 agreement, given they have stated they are able to? This is directly blocking May Day's ability to finalize their Section 106 agreement and complete their planning consent. The second question is, can MDC, Mendip District Council, confirm that because of the delays caused by their refusal to participate in May Day's 106 agreement, the precondition that they've imposed of a December deadline will not result in the planning permission being rescinded. And thirdly, can MDC confirm that they will not proceed with any scheme in Saxonvale until a fair and transparent evaluation of both schemes based on their respective outline applications has taken place? I mean, this is about fairness, this is about transparency, and this is about understanding why um, Mendip seem to be saying one thing publicly and then blocking um, what is an enormously popular and well-supported scheme from proceeding into a fair evaluation process. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Nick. I think it's something that's been on all of our mind. It's, John, have you got any answer to that, first of all? Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, hi, I'm John Clark. I'm a Mendit District Councillor for Market Ward, which also covers Saxonvale. And I wholeheartedly support what Nick Dove is saying. I think it's atrocious that Mendit District Council, having approved both schemes, that's the planning committee, is now putting a block on any discussions about the application in terms of following through the, the two applications and doing what May Day is reasonably asking, which is to compare the two applications, which is what, it, what the, they are asking for in terms of best value for the town, which is the most important thing, I think, but also to some extent, best value for Mendip as well. Um, my personal view is uh, that they are looking at financial benefit rather than social benefit. And I've said this before, uh, and the attraction for May, about May Day is that their scheme is purely about social benefit in the best interest of the town, which is why it received such overwhelming support uh, pre-planning and currently still teens uh, gets overwhelming support. Um, I can't answer all the questions, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not part of the administration. The administration is Liberal Democrats. And it's sad that tonight there is no Liberal Democrat uh, councillor here that I'm aware Adam, of. Adam, Adam is just- Oh, Adam, oh, I apologize, Adam. You are hiding in the corner, perhaps. No, I can see you now, there you are. My apologies. So perhaps Adam would like to give a view of the administration, but he may not be able to do that either. All I can say that as I understand it, uh, the councillors have been told that uh, the administration is not going to engage with May Day at this point. And the reason they're stating for that is that there's a judicial review and uh, they await the outcome of the judicial review. That is my understanding. Now, the judicial review, as I understand it, it is, is due to December. Um, so there'll still be time up until April to have those discussions with May Day. Um, but they are indicating that the decision will be taken ultimately by any new planning board which is put in place by the new Somerset Unity uh, Authority, if you like, uh, post 1st of May. Um, which in some respects may be a positive thing because there will be people on that planning board. It will go to the Assets Committee at Somerset and it won't just be about uh, um, Liberal Democrats who, um, and you know, I may be wrong, but in my personal view, some have not been supportive at all of May Day. So I'm sorry, that's all I can add. Thank you, John. Adam, I'm not going to jump on you the second you've walked in. Catch your breath, Steve. Um, but then Adam, I'll come to you for your view if I may. Steve. Yeah, thanks, um, Tara and uh, Nick and John. I agree. I think um, for what I've been hearing is the there is a fear that um, because the planning permission that was given in August um, 
at the moment is in principle. And May Day have to come back by the 14th of December um, with an agreed section 106. And I think that the, the, the fear at the moment is that Mendip are using that or potentially could use that um, in order to, on the 14th of December, say you haven't got section 106 in place, therefore your planning permit, uh, permission is no longer valid. And I think that's what's uh, creating the, uh, the press and the video that uh, has been sent out. So I think those are the questions that we need to answer, as, uh, as, as Nick rightly pointed out. Thanks. Thank you. Um, just before I come to Adam, um, can I ask councillors, would they like Nick's questions forwarded to Stuart at MDC uh, for answer? Can we all say yay or nay? I think we all do. Um, yes, I'm, yeah, I'm going to get Nick to do a quick resume. Oh, sorry, Mel, have you got, were you, did you have a question? Oh, I, well, I can't see, I'm relying on being... I'm really... No, no, I'm just coughing. Drew. Yeah, I, uh, hello there. I just, just want to make it clear that, uh, that Adam Boyden isn't the only, uh, only councillor present. Uh, I'm attending remotely. My name is Drew Gardner. Uh, I'm a, a Liberal Democrat councillor. I'm in the somewhat unusual position of one uh, publicly supporting this week um, uh, with the May Day petition that that both schemes are uh, considered on their merits. Um, I have got very complex feelings on this. They're, they're very mixed. But I think that my wish, my, my deep, deeply held desire is for people to work together to make this happen, both in Mendip and other parties all working together on this. It is quite a nuanced situation and it isn't black and white, you know, and I think it's really important to bear in mind, I'm not defending this, but I, I, but I just want to make this clear um, that the reason um, the reason there is no uh, there's no face to face meeting is that's legal action from solicitors within the council that it could uh, prejudice the case. So so that's why that has happened. Um, I'm not I'm not defending any of this. You know, I think it's a really vibrant project. It's one that I have supported and I've spoken up about publicly. But it's just. I think it's all well and good having a really great public pressure group, a really great campaign, but it's also really important that for everyone to understand the game has now changed. Uh, May Day are no longer uh, a, a pressure group. They're actually a property developer. And I want to see, I want to see everyone giving it their best shot in every way they can. Great, to, thanks. To, 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 give, to give the town the choice and the council the choice. That's thanks what I that. want to see. Thank you for that, Drew. Nick, can, is there anything, first of all, that you want to come back on then? Can you quickly summarise the question so we can get a point of view from Adam? Yeah, um, very quickly, um, the point around the judicial review, Mayday made it clear they're very happy to meet without prejudice and discuss the matter. So the, the JR is a bit of a red herring. The, the issue here is that it feels as if uh, Mendip have accepted the Saxonvale proposal and then put in place a, a construct that stops them taking it further forward. Uh, Matthew, I'll, I'll read these uh, quick questions to you. I apologise that you'll... Um, <laughs> well, I, I won't apologise, I'll just read them out. Um, first question is, um, can MDC confirm why they are not agreeing to participate in May Day's 106, Section 106 agreement, given they have stated that they are able to? This is directly blocking May Day's ability to finalise their Section 106 agreement and complete their planning consent. Second, can MDC confirm that because of the delays caused by their refusal to participate in May Day's 106 agreement, the precondition of a December deadline will not result in the planning permission being rescinded? And finally, can MDC confirm that they will not proceed with any scheme in Saxon Vale until a fair and transparent evaluation of both schemes based on their respective outline applications 
has taken place. Thank you, Nick. Adam, if we could keep it relatively concise, please. Yeah, absolutely, I will. I mean, I'm, I'm Adam Boyden, District Councillor for Foom College and Somerset County Councillor for Foom North, one of the two of each. Uh, I'm also on the Mendips Planning Board, so I spoke and voted on the May Day outline planning application in August, and I was expecting to come it for it to come back to December with a proposed raft of planning conditions and Section 106 agreement for the planning board, including me and 14 other councillors to to decide on. So I don't um, I don't want to predetermine any any ability of mine to decide on on those because then if I do some some way either way you'll you'll probably get uh, a, a councillor on there who's not from Froome. Uh, which is, I think, less 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 value. And one of the things uh, about uh, planning board is, if you know the site, if you know the town, you know the, the settlement that you're deciding on, you, you might have a, a better opinion about it. Um, I'll to turn to Nick's uh, questions. Um, it's about the about not not participating in the section 106 agreement. Well, I'm not sure that's the case. I've seen I've seen emails from the May Day uh, camp to uh, the top of of Mendip District Council, and I'm not sure why there is a delay, but uh, I'm not I'm not aware that there's any any block of any sort on them doing that because that's a, I think a normal requirement if you're agreeing a Section 106 agreement. It, it, it's a title that goes with the land, so if you don't involve the landowner, it's not valid, and so that's a that's a kind of a legal requirement to involve the landowner. Um, the I, I, so I, I don't speak for the administration here. I'm on planning board. I'm a, I'm a backbencher, as, as it were. Um, so I'm hoping to get some answers out of the administration on that point. And I'll pass that on. Uh, the next question is about, about uh, any delays, meaning that uh, planning permission that was conditionally agreed in August is not rescinded. Well, I think that's the case. And the chair of planning board, Damon Hooten, I think will be, if it's not ready to determine in 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 December, there'll be some sort of uh, agreed extension to to that. So I don't think that's going to be rescinded at all. Well, obviously that's up to the planning board to decide. And the third one is about can Mendip, uh, can Mendip District Council uh, agree not to proceed on anything? Well, I can't speak for, for them. I know there's the judicial review, which has put a bit of a spanner in the, in the proposed meeting, uh, which had been agreed in earlier in, in October between uh, Stuart Brown, Barry, Councillor Barry O'Leary, and so on, and that is, uh, uh, I'm waiting for, for proper legal advice on that, but I've been advised that the legal advice has meant that, as Drew said, and as, as John Clark said, it's too risky for the council to proceed with the meeting when they're suing you, when, when someone's suing the council, uh, because there could be a lot of money at stake, and a lot of public money at stake, so the finance office is advised, and that's not a laughing matter at all, it's the finance office is advising you need to get council advice, Council then advises strongly that you do not meet, then you really can't go against that. And I think this council will be in the same position if it had a similar case. You'd say, "Sorry, we can't, we can't do it." But uh, also, I do appreciate the, the 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 feeling in the room and the feeling in the town about uh, being proactive. So I would ask maybe uh, uh, my colleagues at Mendip to be more proactively communicating about this to the town, to the town council, and so on, to say set out what the situation actually is, because otherwise we get lots of rumour and conspiracy theories and hearsays and so on build up and frustration builds, and, and then we've seen where that goes in other parts of the world. Thank you. I, I hope that's enough. That's, uh, that's, that's <laughs> great. Thank you for that explanation, Nick. Is there any? Okay, that's brilliant. Was there a couple of questions over there? Just a few more minutes on this, yes? Thank you. Um, so just a little bit confused, only having been to one town council meeting before. Does this mean then that after Steve Deacon's presentation, we don't get to ask questions? No, it doesn't mean that. No. Oh, OK, that's great. Um, so what questions do you want right now? <laughs> General questions, any particular questions, for, uh, opportunity for councillors to raise questions. Sure. Any other members of the public that are here with specific questions? Okay, I think maybe our questions wait until after the presentation, if that's okay. If that's what they're relevant to, and then yes, that'll really, be great. Yeah. That'll Thank be you. great. Thank you. Uh, any other more general questions from councillors or residents? So just to clarify, councillors like me to, to forward those questions that Nick has read out to the Chief Executive of Mendip District Council. Will do, yeah. will do. 
Thank you and thank you for that. Uh, okay, so the next item is indeed the presentation from Steve Deakin, Parking Services Manager at Somerset County Council on the Residence Parking Schemes. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, as has just been said, I'm Steve Deakin, the Parking Services Manager for Somerset County Council. Uh, thank you for inviting me to come here to Froome. Um, always happy to come. Um, which button is it to move forward? Oh, to the right. Um, as Froome, such an old ancient town, I just thought it'd be helpful to have a quick history lesson to lighten the, uh, the meeting at this stage. And I, I can't. Um, this goes back to the 17th century where King John said in a, in a highway, the king has nothing but the passage for himself and his people, or in modern words, uh, members of the public have the right to pass and repass along any highway. They do not have the right to stop on it. So that's the context and the historical um, matter. And as Froome is so old, I um, thought that would be helpful. Uh, the, the other thing I thought it'd be helpful to look at is what's happened with car ownership in Froome. Now, according to the DVLA, in, you can see at the start of 2020, there were 20 and a half thousand vehicles registered to the BA11 postcode. Um, that's increased by 18% up until the end of last year. Um, there's now 24,200, and I don't remember any sort of main new roads being built in the in the centre of Froome. So car ownership is is rising, and that doesn't include anyone who's got who's got a vehicle in Froome, and it's registered somewhere else because it's their their company vehicle. So this is the context we're trying to to work in. So again, another slight history lesson. Um, we originally received a petition request from the residents of Weymouth Road, and they asked that we investigate what options are available to improve parking, traffic management, and highway safety in Weymouth Road. And that was signed by sufficient numbers to warrant resources being assigned to, to investigating that. And as part of the consultation and to work out what we can do, that was the area that the consultation covered initially. Out of that consultation initially, Weymouth Road and Somerset Road indicated that there was support for a, for a parking scheme. The other roads, such as Nunny Road, Queen's Road, Domitz Lane, weren't supportive, so they were um, nothing, nothing proceeded with, 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 with those roads. We subsequently advertised the formal traffic order, which covered Weymouth Road and Somerset Road. There was a large number of objections which were considered. Uh, Somerset Road, it was, the view had changed in, in having looked at their, their responses. So, so Somerset Road was withdrawn from the scheme and the residents advised so we've gone ahead with the, the Weymouth Road scheme, and that's been done on an experimental basis. And one of, the, one of those actions was to look at what I've called the Trinity area, and apologies for if that's, if that's wrong, but on our mapping, uh, Trinity was mentioned there. So I've got to call it something, otherwise I sort of forget which area I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. So it was agreed to undertake some consultation in this area, to see whether a similar sort of arrangement should, should proceed. And that consultation has just closed, but if anyone wants to send in a, a late response, that's not a problem. Responses will be accepted until the point I've read them all and analyzed them all and prepare uh, the, the outcome of what, of what they're saying. So what happens next? Um, as I just said, I will review all the responses to that Trinity area consultation and have an idea of what the residents are telling me. I will then undertake a review of the impact of Weymouth Road and that experimental traffic order, and that will be with 
those residents in that original consultation area. Um, and that the outcome of those two reviews will hopefully identify the way forward for the Weymouth Road area, plus maybe some others, and the Trinity Road area. We've also got uh, the Froome School Streets to reduce school-related traffic coming along. And the last time I was aware, that's looking to come in into effect spring of next year. Uh, and that will no doubt have an impact as, as the intention is to remove all the school-related traffic during the morning and afternoon pickups from uh, the main roads affecting Oak, Oakfield School, Critchell School, Green Lane and Park Road. And longer term, and this will happen once the new unitary authority has been uh, created, there will, there will be the Froome-wide review um, because as a single authority, car parks are now within, the, for want of a better word, the control and management of a single authority. So it's much easier to consider the role they play in managing parking and traffic. And that's all I want to say formally. I'm sure there will be some questions. Thank you very much, Steve. I can tell there's lots of enthusiasm for questions over there and around the room. So we'll start over there with the lady with the blonde hair. Arm up. <laughs> can you just say who you are, please, before you, before you sure. ask? Sure, yeah. So I'm Marina Swinburne. I've contacted many of you in this room. Some have kindly responded, others haven't. However, um, yeah, just a few points, Steve. Um, I know um, I know you've received quite a few messages from myself. Um, maybe just very quickly, I appreciate you're short on time. Just to say one of the reasons that this has become so important is it really does affect our working life, family life. I know of people who are moving from the area because they can no longer park, because they become older, have mobility issues, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't just you know a problem that is becoming annoying and needs to be forgotten about. It really is a problem. Um, you know, we work, we use our cars, we have to fund ourselves, etc. Sorry, just wanted to vent that one. Um, so a few questions I had are, for instance, um, when the original petition went in from Weymouth Road, and it was mainly around traffic safety, and we have spoken to the original person who set up the petition, we're very curious about what other um, options were considered, because Really, residence permits doesn't seem the obvious solution to a traffic safety uh, issue. So we were very curious about that and we did put in a freedom of information request and it seems that no other options were considered. I don't know if that's inaccurate information. However, that is what the freedom of information request said. So um, it, things like that we're quite curious about. We're also curious about things like how the review will be carried out. How will you know? Is it just talking to residents or are we gaining sort of information about speeding? Because interestingly enough, the police are still telling us that it's not safe enough on Weymouth Road to carry out speed, um, speed what are they called? Not traps, tests. Thank you very much. Community speed tests. Um, are, we, are you going to be counting numbers of um, cars, etc.? So we're very curious about the review. Um, also, who carries it out? Is it is it yourselves or is it an outside body? Those kind of questions. Um, so we're also curious about why, when Somerset Road was dropped from the scheme, it didn't go back to reconsultation at that point because obviously it would have significant impact on Somerset Road and indeed is doing. Um, and I really, I do wonder how that impact will be um, assessed actually in the review. I'm also curious about the original area that was chosen because it did leave out um, areas very close by that would be impacted hugely. Um, and the other thing is we all felt a bit daft for not really having realized what had gone on and, and that this scheme was there. And again, the freedom of information request shows that no public minutes were taken and they weren't there. So there does seem to be a lack of transparency because otherwise we may have become involved a lot sooner given how much impact it does have on ourselves. Should we give Steve a chance to come back on some of that? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, Apologies, Steve. No, that's, that's absolutely fine. I'll deal with the last one first, the freedom information request. And what happens is I've written down a few notes on there uh, and that will go now in the bin. Okay. 
So if anyone asks what notes did I take from today, there won't be any unless Froome Town Council have minuted it, and that will be um, the, the, the formal record of minutes. With regard to speed, I've ordered a speed test for Weymouth Road, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to request that for a two-week period, and that will then give us actually what, what, what speed is happening over a full 24-hour period, and that does count the number of vehicles as well. Uh, and once we've got that, that will tell us something, and we will then clearly guide us as to, to what, was happen what is happening with regard to speed. Um, when Somerset Road was, was taken out, the, the, those residents would have been aware of that process that they were, it was proposing to... I'll have to, I would have to check one, I would have to check one of the, one of the, one, one, uh, one of the letters. Um, my experience is that residents are very quick to tell, tell us if they don't agree with something as is happening, as is happening now. Um, the, the review will take place of the Weymouth Road, primarily in that um, border that I, that I showed earlier, but I will discuss the, the boundary with Froome Town Council and the two county councillors, because it's always really difficult to work out where do I draw the line for consultation. If I go out too far, it just gets diluted because the people who are further and further away sort of say, well, why are you writing to me? Um, it's, it's, it's always difficult to, uh, and that boundary was seen as the, the best option at the time. In reviewing that initial petition, and the petition did, it did make, it, it talked about, it did say parking. There's no mention of speed in the petition. Um, and the letter that went out did talk about other other options that are available. Um, we could have just put yellow lines and chicane it as we go up the road, but that would have taken away half the parking along Weymouth Road because um, nobody would have been able to park on that side. So we would have been in a similar situation as you would now. And actually that makes it worse for, for the residents. Um, the option of any hard physical measures was discussed briefly with colleagues, but the, the availability of funding was difficult back, at, back in that, that time. And there was no evidence to say that that was needed. And, uh, our road safety record, and I will check uh, what the current status is, there's nothing to suggest there was a, a, uh, a large number of accidents. Is that? Have you finished? I, I think I have. Can I just say one thing? Sorry, Tristan, we're not fighting. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm just aware if it really was about parking, then when you look at things like the Traffic Management Act, they're quite clear about things like if you have a significant amount of off road parking, you don't. Why well, you shouldn't be considering residence permits? So I'm really curious about that because I've always been told that it was primarily about safety. So I'm curious about that, and also yeah. I mean, we, I'm really sorry, we could go on and on and on, and it's not the time, but that is one thing I'm very aware of. I think there's perhaps some of these we can note for you to come back on, possibly, because I do want to hear from as many people as I possibly can. Is that something, so Tristan? I just got one question for you. Uh, I'm Tristan Powell. I, I was always told when I was a kid at school, because you've given us a history lesson, when I was at school, if I didn't understand anything, I put my hand up and ask a question. I'd like you to explain why you say that introducing the permit in Weymouth Road has now reduced the demand for parking. I don't understand that answer. And you've gleefully proclaimed that in your response. And I want you to explain that to me how it has reduced the demand for parking, please. Prior to, prior to, the, prior to the scheme coming to Weymouth Road, because I had be, been up there multiple times, there was nowhere to park. So a resident who comes home for whatever reason and needs to or chooses to park on the road could not. Whereas, whereas now oh, yeah, yeah. there is space for for the residents. The road is empty. 
now. The road is empty now. Is that a result that you're happy with? And I'd like to ask the councillors here if they're happy with that result too, that the road is now empty. There's 34 cars on there, even at night time. We've, we've counted every day. There used to be 122 cars there. The road's empty now, and it's been knocked on. You've displaced parking into other streets and caused a problem. And I'd like to ask you and the councillors here if you're happy with that result, and then I'm going to go. Can I just take some observations from people I know? I've got a list here. Yes, sir, you are on the list. Uh, Bob Ashford, please. Right, thank you. I'm speaking as a, as a resident of Somerset Road. And as someone who uh, unfortunately has been, been observing this kind of saga since it began, and it began, I think, in 2019, actually, and it was a public meeting. It was a meeting in this room, which was called by, by the local councillor who's here tonight, with yourself, Steve, and that was for residents of Weymouth Road only. I, I gate crashed that meeting, and the point that I made was that whatever you do in Weymouth Road is going to have a negative displacement effect on everywhere else around. And that was taken on board. So the consultation then took place with not just residents in Weymouth Road, but also those in Somerset Road and Nunny Road, et cetera, and around the area. And uh, what, what then happened was that there, there was a scheme which was devised. And I, I've been reading through, I've got a sheath of correspondence here, correspondence here from you, Steve. And nowhere does that mention road safety. Every heading is about a road park, about a traffic, sorry, about a parking scheme a residence parking scheme. For some time, residents who live in the Weymouth Road have suffered congested parking, some of it caused by non-residents. This has caused some concerns about being able to park on your return home. And all the correspondence is in that vein. It's not about road safety, it's all about a parking scheme. What happened then was that residents in Somerset Road and the other roads were presented with a parking scheme, which actually incorporated Somerset and Weymouth Road. And we were asked to vote on that. Residents or the people who replied in Weymouth Road replied by a majority to actually go forward with that proposal. The people in Somerset Road voted by a much smaller majority to go forward with that proposal. We then received a letter from, from Steve saying the proposal was going to go ahead in Somerset Road and Weymouth Road, a joint scheme. The next we heard about it was that people then began people then became aware of what was going on. So other local residents, the bowls club, the tennis club, and other people said, so if there's going to be a parking permit scheme only in Weymouth Road and Somerset Road, where are people going to park? Where are we going to park? Where are people who use the park going to park? And the answer to that or response from that without any further consultation was a further letter we received from Mr. Deacon saying, because of this, now the only scheme that was going to go ahead was in Weymouth Road. So what we've ended up with is a scheme which, in fact, nobody voted for because the overall scheme, the consultation was on Weymouth and Somerset Road jointly. What we've got is a scheme that nobody has actually voted for. And what we have also, I'm afraid to say, it's a classic result of a small group of residents who made a fuss, quite rightly, because they were concerned about parking in their area. And what's happened as a result is that the wider needs of the local community, the wider needs of the town, have been ignored or not considered. And that's especially important when the roads we're talking about adjoin a beautiful open space which people want to go to. They can't all cycle there. They can't all park there. And I really am concerned about that. So where we go, where we go from here, I've heard Steve talk about a review. I've not been informed of any review. I have no idea when that started, if it has started, what it looks like. We're being talked that what's being talked about is a is a, 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 a traffic survey. I think the last one was in 2014. Forgive me for being cynical, but I can't see an awful lot coming from that. And I voted against this, both those schemes to begin with on the basis that I believe, going back to the history lesson, Steve, that public highways are just that. They are not. You know, purely for the benefit of a small group of residents or car owners or everyone. They are for everyone. Residents, car owners, cyclists, walkers. And what we have now as a result, as a gentleman over there said, 
is Weymouth Road, which is completely empty most of the time. And what's happened now is that all the cars are now parking on Weymouth Road and all the other surrounding streets. And what we do have now is a real road safety issue because the parking, particularly in Somerset Road, I'm sure you're aware, that parking now is rammed with people up against the hedge and there's no pavement there. So children are bundled out of their cars into the main road where there's nowhere else to park and cars are going down there at great speed to try to avoid the lack of you know, places to pull in. So as you can tell, I'm not very uh, impressed by what's happened. I'm not impressed by the consultation and I don't, I'm not impressed by the outcome and I'm not impressed by where this is intended to go. I think, and I'm sure most of the people here who have come tonight about this scheme think that Weymouth Road should be abandoned and the whole Trinity area scheme should also be abandoned as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, thank you, Steve. I'm going to give you the right to reply, but I'm going to take some other comments first. Is that okay? Just so we can group them. Um, Drew, you were next. I can I ask you not to repeat anything that's already been said, though, if that was going to be any of your points? I've got him. Everyone who's had their hand up is on the list. Uh, Drew. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I just really want to to um, talk to Steve uh, about a point, which is my son cycles down Somerset Road um to school uh, i've cycled with him uh, numerous occasions um he's been clipped by cars twice now while cycling i've seen it myself um i think the whole problem with parking isn't easy um but something does need to be done school streets is going to be interesting but i think we all need to think much more widely than it being just about the parking it's you know, um, and I'm sure speaking to residents here on Somerset Road, when we've had the road blocked time after time after time with all the school drop offs parked and the buses can't get round the corner, causing traffic chaos, the whole thing does need to be looked at in the round and not just from the point of view of uh, abandoned Weymouth, do this in Somerset, do this in what, whatever. It's got to be looked at in the round in the best interests of everybody. So we have a safer area. Thanks, Thank Drew. You. Jane, Llewellyn. Thank you. Uh, a similar question, really, but just wanted to clarify something about the Weymouth Road Review. Um, will that consultation in Weymouth Road only, or was that the area that you were talking about agreeing with the Town Council? If it is residents only that get a specific consultation letter, can anybody actually, anybody who hasn't got a letter also respond to that consultation? And how would we go about getting the, the word out about that consultation and how people can respond to it? Okay, just a few more and then we're going to have to draw a line. Fiona, yes, everyone, you've, yes, you're on the list, you're on the list. Fiona. Um, I'm Fiona, Foom Town Councillor for Oakfield Ward. A uh, bit of a change of pace with my question. I was just really struck by those numbers on car ownership. And I just wanted to know whether you had any sense of why it has increased because the population of Foom hasn't increased that much. So I just wondered what your thoughts were on why. Thank you. The gentleman behind you with his hand up. Gordon Alexander, resident in Christchurch Street West, but formerly uh, someone who parked legally for 20 years in Weymouth Road. Uh, I do contest uh, really from ab initio uh, how the consultation into the introduction of the Weymouth Road scheme uh, was introduced. It was introduced, uh, it was advertised, I should say, advertised uh, in the three weeks before Christmas 2020, when we were in lockdown, um, even before the consultation period was up. The notices on the lampposts uh, were illegible because of rain and condensation. There was no chance because of lockdown for anyone to organise any kind of coordinated uh, opposition uh, or protest against it. Um, in terms of numbers, I challenge what Steve said earlier on. Basically, before lockdown, um, when the scheme was first advertised, I should say, there was space for 110 cars on Weymouth Road between Somerset Road and Christchurch Street. Um, I counted them all. And that was the maximum possible. But in the whole of Weymouth Road, there are only 12 houses, just 12 houses that don't have their own parking either on forecourts or driveways or in garages at the back service road, uh, which runs parallel. So there were just 12 houses in Weymouth Road that could justifiably ask for and expect a residence only parking scheme 
everybody else is perfectly able and should be parking on their own driveways and forecourts and in their own garages if they have them. Why should they have the benefit of a large house garden and garages and still want to park on the public highway? That's unacceptable. There's only 12 houses in Weymouth, and I repeat it again and again, which justify having any sort of controlled parking zone. And as for the rest of it, we now have on average, all throughout the day, no more than 15 cars above the park uh, that's the southern end of Weymouth Road, and rarely more than 10 cars below the park. So we have no more than 25 cars parked any time of the day on a road that can, could accommodate 90. And all those cars that could have parked there are simply parking somewhere else. And the displacement factor is key. And I submit that you have not considered it properly under the terms of the Traffic Management Act in bringing the scheme into operation at all. That should be reconsidered. And uh, I should also say that if you're now conducting a review into your own scheme, which is a bit like marking your own homework, I honestly hope you will accept criticism and views from people like me who are currently excluded from getting a permit, a permit under the scheme. So although the scheme originally only went out for consultation to Weymouth Road and Somerset Road, and I think Park Road residents, um, the other people affected in the St. Catharines area and my neighbours in Christchurch Street must also have a say too in the review you're conducting. And I hope that is the case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very tight. Last couple of questions. Gentlemen in the blue and Polly. Yes. Sorry. Working. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to, to respond to two or three comments that were made. One thing I'd like to say, I'm, by the way, I'm a Weymouth Road resident who's delighted with the, the parking scheme. Uh, the situation that is being described in Somerset Road now is exactly the situation that was in Weymouth Road before the scheme came in. I'm not saying that the Weymouth Road scheme should be kept at the expense of another road, but what I'm saying is if you simply scrap the Weymouth Road scheme, all that will happen is that things will return to a status quo, which was completely unacceptable before. Second thing I'd like to say is that uh, there are a lot fewer cars in Weymouth Road now than there were. Some of those are displaced Weymouth Road car owners because the nature of the permit scheme means that people with multiple cars can't park on the road. So they're now parking on their off the road scheme. So yes, they've got the luxury of off road parking. They're now using it because of the scheme. It's not as convenient, it's not as safe as parking on the road. Uh, if anybody knows the uh, Queen's Road approach road, it's, it's, it's not a well lit, not a safe road. You wouldn't want to leave your ho a high value car there. Uh, people are doing that now because they've been driven off the road as well. Point three. If I can ask you to be very, very brief, sir. Okay. The, a speeding survey will give you no useful information now because you've got no baseline data from when it was heavily parked to compare it with. You won't be finding out that the uh, road is safer or more dangerous than it was before because there are no figures fr from before. Um, Froome Town Council are intending to in introduce a school street scheme, which is in effect going to bring in residents parking for those streets in the school street scheme. If you can't drive there because you're not in the school street scheme, you can't park there. So ironically, Somerset Road is slated by Froome Town Council to become a free residence parking area as of next spring, because people won't be able to park there because they can't drive there. Can we treat that one as a separate question? for now it's if relevant can. to this absolutely it is this. i'm just very conscious um, of time i'm going to take one more quick point and then i'm going to have to draw a line underneath it and give steve a right to reply polly i'm trying to, i've got to keep this in order i've only, I've, I've got the time i've got polly hello i'm polly lamb i'm a Froome town councillor for park ward so weymouth road is in my ward um i'm over here steve <laughs> hello so uh, we were in a meeting with you before and um, you said that you were going to, um, uh, well, we, we requested that you hold off the decision on the Trinity area consultation um, until Unitree. Is that 
when you were just talking earlier, it sounded like, you know, the consultation is finished and it sounded like you were going to move towards a decision. So I just wanted to confirm, um, I haven't heard anything about whether or not you are still considering holding that off because obviously the heat coming off the Weymouth Road um, consultation, you'll get a similar thing with Trinity. So I just wanted to confirm that you are still considering holding that off until the change in unitary because then you're talking about a widespread parking review, which would take everything into account, including car parks. Um, and the other thing is, could you remind people how long the experiment is for in Weymouth Road? Because I think you passed over that quite quickly in your in your uh, presentation. I'm going to hand over to, back to Steve now because that's been a lot of questions, a lot of information. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I need to keep this all very swift now for the next for the next few minutes. So if I can ask you to be as concise as possible, we may have time for another couple of questions and I need to come back to a couple of councillors as well. So, Steve. OK, thank you. Yeah, th th there was a lot there. I have made a few notes and I'll take them in reverse order. Um, I accept that we won't know what the speed was before, but it's interesting that uh, Somerset Road is now what Weymouth Road used to be. So perhaps a good um, option is let's have the speed for Somerset Road as well, just to see uh, what is happening. Um, the experimental order is for a maximum of 18 months. At the end of 18 months, once any objections and comments are being considered, the order either ends or is made permanent. What we are planning to do is to do that within the first six months, because that's the, the ideal. Um, now, with regard to the review area, it will be at least the original area that I highlighted in one, in one of those slides. It won't just be Weymouth Road because I suspect we know what the, without prejudging what the gentleman said, I suspect we'll know what the answer is if I just ask Weymouth Road. They'll, they'll say, it's lovely, perfect, make it permanent and stop writing to us. Clearly there are displacement issues which were considered in part of the original consultation in my mind, um, but for, for, for reasons um, at the time that uh, there was, it was inconclusive. So, so that, that review will include that wider area. How that is worded, I don't know yet. Um, and I do accept that any consultation, people will have a view, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. And we can always learn and we, we, we continue to learn. Uh, if you look at the questions on the the trinity one that's just gone out they are slightly that they are different and provide a bit more of a focus than the original one so we you know, we do learn and we'll continue to learn and and refine it with regard to a decision on trinity road i think the answer will be once i've read all of the responses and worked out what people are telling me um, but before any decision is made, uh, there is a process to go through in talking in particular with, with the two county members um, for the area and letting you know, Froome Town Council will, will be on that, on that distribution list. Um, I do have an inkling what people are saying at, based on the responses so far. Um, but once, once I've read them all and made some sense of them, then I will discuss so with, with the two county councillors. Um, it, it would be wrong for me to commit to say we will definitely go ahead with something, uh, in as much as it'd also be wrong for me to say we won't do anything till post unitary, because clearly, if we've got hundreds of residents saying we want you to do something and we're supportive of it, is it right that we ignore those when, 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 when we've got the ability uh, to do it? Um, the existence of off-street parking doesn't preclude residents in any particular road in requesting some form of scheme. 
Now, the scheme could have been, as I said, yellow lines on either side of the road, because one of the comments we were getting, there was congestion, and I suspect there was an element of speeding as people were racing along Weymouth Road to get to the gap before the before the, the oncoming car. And I suspect that may well be happening in Somerset Road. I've seen that, I've seen that happen. Take though, if you do clear the road, the traffic will move much slower because there's more natural passing places. So even if we'd have put yellow lines, the capacity for parking would have reduced because we'd have created chicanes. We'd have, we'd have also had to put lots of yellow lines across people's drives because feedback was coming out. They can't get off their drive. They'd love to park on their, on their drive, but they can't because cars are parking right up to the drive and, and they couldn't get out. Sorry, I think we meant more like speed bumps and pedestrian crossings and all those sort of things as well, and islands and all that being considered, not really um, yellow lines. At the time, there was no evidence to suggest that they were needed. There was no act, there was no accident data to say that they were needed, and funding funding was an issue and remains an issue for such um, for, for such type of schemes. Um, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't let this turn into a general debate. I, I, was, ju I was just taking advice on what to do. I can't let this turn into a general debate. I was just about, I was just about to ask her. So I just, I need to manage this conversation. I will come back. To, I will come back to you, sir. I just need to give everybody their airtime, and I also need to hear from a couple of other councillors. Um, Mark Dorrington, I know, wants to come in here, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, Miss Deacon, thanks very much for coming and coming in person as well, which is uh, good of you. Um, we first met in in 2018 when I chaired the meeting that Bob referred to here, where Weymouth Road was first discussed at that meeting. We were promised a town-wide review of parking to take in every aspect of parking in the town. Uh, can I ask why that hasn't happened since 2018? Um, two reasons, unfortunately. One, we, there was a pandemic, uh, which caused a lot of change in um, officer activity, and more recently, a change in administration. So we're just working through um, what that means. Um, but um, having had conversations with the, with, the, with the new executive member, there is a commitment for these reviews to take place. And he's very keen that the reviews take place, um, including car parks, because he recognised that unless you include the car parks in seeking the views of residents, now you're only dealing with half the issue. And okay, so that, that explains that. Um, with regard to Weymouth Road, you say there will be a review. In your experience, has anyone ever overturned the, the imposition of residence parking in Somerset? No. So it's doomed to success. Or, um, or if I can just add, add to that, um, nor anywhere else. Okay, that's in. Um, Yolanda and others is, who started the um, conversation about how this affects Trinity. Um, I live in Trinity. I didn't get one of these letters, but uh, luckily somebody passed it to me. It seems a bit of a knee-jerk reaction that if anybody has a question about parking, then the response from the county is, would you like residence parking? Um, Yolanda explained other alternatives. Um, and the way the letter is written, it's benefits of a residence parking scheme, uh, why you, we should have it, pages and pages of that. Um, do you support the introduction of a scheme? Yes or no? If no, why not? It's, uh, and when should parking restrictions apply? It doesn't say should parking restrictions apply. And it concludes with the benefits of a residence parking scheme. I would like to have seen a more open consultation than that, really. It seems that 
you know, residence parking is the only way to go forward. And so Bob's already spoken about the knock-on effect of displacement into Somerset Road. Where does it stop? Somerset, Trinity has its parking scheme. Then that moves across the road, uh, Vallis, up into Nunny Road, Broadway. Where does it stop? Everybody will end up parking in the field in Nunny at this rate. So where, why is that the only scheme that the county seems to be the way of dealing it with any parking issue? Steve, can I just interrupt there? What I'm going to do now, because we're running so short of time on this, I'm going to let the gentleman in the blue jumper finish his point. I'm going to take one more point from Bob Ashford, one more right of reply, and then I'm going to ask that any further questions be sent to Steve in writing, but that Steve, you have an obligation to then reply to those questions and letters from um, residents that have taken part in this meeting this evening. So for expedience, sir, in the blue jumper at the back. So two points. Uh, one is that um, this, this supposed existence of, of off-road parking isn't necessarily the case. Uh, what people do with land within the boundary of their property, with structures within the boundary of their property, unless it breaks planning law, is none of Somerset, Froomtown Council, Mendip District Council's business. I have a neighbour who's turned his garage into a recording studio. He does not have off-road parking in that space now and that's none he was given planning permission for that perfectly reasonable doesn't count so when people walk along roads and say oh they've got a garage they've got a garage they've got a garage they've got a garage we don't know that now many people work from home they may have offices they may have all sorts of things behind those doors it's none of Froome Town Council or Somerset Council's business the other thing I would say is the, exist, the, the lack of any reporting of accidents does not mean there are not multiple, multiple accidents. I have had my car hit many, many, many times. I look at the damage. I look at my excess on my insurance. I don't even report it if it's going to cost me more to, to, to put it through the insurance than it is to take it to the to repair shop. Noted. Thank you. Uh, and that is, that is the case with everybody's car. Thank you. Major accidents, different issue. Minor accidents, there are dozens and dozens and dozens on all these through residential roads. Point noted. Bob, very quickly, please. You need, you need a mic because of the online people. I'll just say that I think the saddest thing about this is the acrimony and division that this has caused. You know, we've seen resident against resident, street against street, community against community. And this should have and could have been handled very, very differently. So we didn't get to this situation. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, uh, highlighted, obviously, lots of high feelings. Steve, would it be acceptable to you if we ask uh, people to put their questions and further comments in writing? Is that acceptable to residents? That, well, that would, that would be something that we can note in this meeting, Steve. Is that possible for us to note in this meeting? Yes. I'm very sorry to anyone who hasn't had a chance to answer a question. Packed room, not a lot of time. Anita, very quickly, comment from you. Thank you. Um, I just thought it was worth saying that, um, Steve, you've been very good in coming along this evening to face this, probably knowing that you were going to have a barrage of questions thrown at you tonight. Uh, and I think sometimes it takes a bit of courage knowing that to turn up. So where well, a lot of people would refuse to do that. So uh, in the essence of fairness, I think it's only right to thank you for coming. Yeah, well done. Um, can I just say Last one? comment. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, it's never been my approach to, to run away. I fell out with, in previous roles, fell out with people who made decisions behind, um, anonymously in, in some ways. And um, Jane has got my details and Jane will soon harangue me um, if, if, if I don't get respon uh, responses out. Uh, apologies if responses are slow. Resourcing has been an issue, um, but I'm... I'm on holiday the end of November. When I'm back, I'm, I'm training a, a new member of staff to, to actually manage that inbox. Um, so that, 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 will, that, that will certainly help. And I am more than happy to return. My only caveat is, is if I am not, if I'm genuinely not able to come, it's because I can't come. It's not because I won't come. 
because I do actually want to be able to come to Froome and walk, walk around the independent market one Sunday without being... <laughs> Without being without being chased out of town with burning pitchforks, because that's that's no, that's not what I'm about. And yes, we we will learn from from this process, and we'll get it right, and we'll work. There there will be a solution. I promise you that. I've I've never yet failed to find a, to find a solution. Some of you won't like it, but some of you will. But unfortunately, that's life. And I will do whatever I can to, 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 to find the compromise. Thank you. And we have it noted that you'll answer any questions in writing. I'm very sorry. I cannot take any more questions. I absolutely have no time. There were other people waiting as well. Really do not have any more time. I would sum the council that instigating with residents being, I think I should have the right to I did put my hand up and you acknowledged my hand. I would like the opportunity. I've, I've had to I've had to take as many as I could. Please go ahead, John. Firstly, let me say um, I'm also sad that this has caused such division, and clearly mistakes were made, and it could have been done better. And I apologise for that. However, I responded to residents' concerns about uh, safety issues and the welfare of pedestrians and people who use the road in terms of drivers and those who live in the street. I believe we followed due process to consultation and a decision was rightly made with those people that were consulted. And I know there's an issue about people who weren't consulted and I acknowledge that, but the decision was made. And I think now we have to move on. There is going to be a review and that will be the opportunity to people voice their views. And as Steve is saying, there will be a solution. My last point and only second point is that the wider issue is not necessarily about parking. I'm sorry, it is about the numbers of cars in town. It's about people having safe, being able to safely use their, cycle, their bikes. I'm a cyclist, we've heard from Drew about this the accidents that happen, and some of those incidents happen in Weymouth Road, and I'm sure happen in every street, because the town is not built for the volume of traffic. So any parking review, I think, is, is a mistake in some respects, unless it includes how you look at infrastructure for other people who want to use the highway and people who want to walk and cycle, and children who are able to walk safely to school. That should be the review. That's what should happen. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions. Uh, that was a good debate. And please do um, put your questions in writing to Steve. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to move swiftly on to the next agenda item, which is Claire, uh, Peter, and Nikki about Free and Welcomes Refugees. Yep, sure. You need a mic, though. Can I please remind everyone to speak into the mic because the people online at home can't hear otherwise. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Whenever you're ready, Claire. Hello, my name's Claire Hine. I know quite a few of you in the room, which is great. And my um, dear friend and colleague, Peter, behind me. Um, and Nikki will speak after me. So uh, this is going to be brief, given the very long conversations that have just been going on. <laughs> <laughs> Even briefer than I was going to be, and I was going to be brief. Um, I think the things that Peter and I would want to say about Froome Welcomes Refugees is that back in March, there was a massive community, and I mean Froome-wide community, raising to the challenge of what we were all watching on our screens on a you know, daily, if not hourly basis in regards to uh, Putin's absolutely illegal attack onto Ukraine. Um, so Peter, 
Peter, myself and Luke Wilde from 2050, who's been very supportive and um, was instrumental in starting Free Welcome to Refugees because he had work colleagues in the Ukraine, got together and held a meeting in March in this very room, which was incredibly well attended by people from across the town. Um, from that, uh, things moved on very rapidly through medical practice were approached to see if they could start to be the um, point of reference for the welfare checks that were needed by refugees who were going to come to the country. We had an initial um, WhatsApp group for potential hosts. And it really was an example of Froome community creating a self-help organization, albeit in a completely informal manner, in a very, very rapid response kind of way. Um, we got hold of some Ukrainian speakers who then translated um, something that the group wrote, which was a welcome guide for hosts and for refugees, because I have to say at this point, there was hardly any information coming out of Somerset County Council or Mendip District Council. That's changed. But at that point, it was really difficult. So again, it was the community doing it for themselves. Um, the first guests arrived at the very beginning of April. So really no time at all, given that the scheme went live on the 18th of March. Um, the schools in Froome have been absolutely brilliant. St. Louis, Avanti, Vallis, Oakfield, Selwood have been fantastic because of the northern villages that have been involved, likewise the college, and indeed All Hallows took um, a couple of pupils as well. Um, we created informal networks for trauma support, we shared information with local communities in, to the north in the Hardington Vale, as indeed with Bruton as well, who also had links, direct links with the Ukraine. Uh, we, on the back of the generosity of the financial generosity of people in Froome, uh, we created a small grants fund, which Peter might want to talk about in a moment, but the, the <laughs> he says he doesn't, somebody might want to ask him a question, um, but the, the criteria for that was that it was quick and simple and generous. These people were refugees, they were in a desperate state, it wasn't and I was very involved with the uh, Syrian refugees. There was a much longer lead into Syrian refugees coming to Froome. Um, so in some respects, th this was a, a rapid reaction. I wouldn't say knee jerk, but a rapid reaction. So the small grants fund enabled us to give each new guest, adult guest, 50 pounds cash. I, I was able to take those to the guests. That was a total of 1,350 pounds. Um, that was held by Rotary and Froome Town Council, but again, it was the it was Froome doing it. We've had 14 experienced, qualified um, language teachers, ably run by Lick and Mick and Lynn Randall, who've been doing informal lessons right across the town from the from way back along. Um, we've had a summer school that Sue Warringham organized. She got all her volunteers DBS checked because they were working with vulnerable children and adults. You know, the, the, the impetus from this town has been absolutely extraordinary. In June, uh, moving in towards July, Somerset County Council, Mendip District Council finally said, right, we're on the case. We're going to get on with it. Um, and uh, that was really good news. And then in July, an, an organization charity called Caris or Charis? Caris came on board as well, um, which then enabled Froome Town Council to have a contract with Caris, who was subcontracted from Somerset County Council, to employ some workers for a year, um, who then came into post in mid-October. And I was about to hand over to Nikki, but I can't see her. Oh, you should have moved over there. Um, so they came in in October. So, so the informal... Froome Welcomes Refugees handed over um, quite quickly to the town council. And I'm going to hand over to Nikki now. Thank you, Hello, Claire. everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Nikki Cox. I am a community project officer in Kate's team. Um, so I was tasked with leading on the refugee support for Froome and the surrounding area. Uh, so Initially, what we did is we appointed two Ukrainian citizens to the roles of social facilitator and hub coordinator. That was part of the Caris contract. It was for a year. It's for a year. Uh, they started on October the 10th. 
um, both rolls are for 18 and a half hours each. So what have we done so far? So we, um, the first thing that we did was actually do a questionnaire because what we wanted to do was make sure that we embedded a participative culture. So we weren't doing to refugees, we were actually working alongside them. Um, both employees are Ukrainian citizens, um, refugees themselves. So in terms of um, ensuring that the service delivery is, is culturally appropriate, we've got the right people in the role. iLine manage them, but we work in partnership with lots of organizations across Froome. Um, the intention is to host a weekly space in the cafe downstairs um, for all refugees. And it's really important that at this point we're talking about all refugees. We've had refugees from Kurdistan and from Syria, not just Ukrainians. Um, the, um, the first thing was to understand the current housing crisis, because that's what was coming up in the refugee in the survey was that actually people were really concerned about housing. So we've worked with our comms team on a campaign to uh, try and get more host families and to look at the housing situation, working really closely with Mendip and Somerset. Um, We've obviously worked in partnership with brilliant work that Claire and Peter have done and 2050, as well as the uh, ESOL language teachers. And we're now working with uh, Wiltshire College in terms of their service delivery. Um, and also um, revisiting the terms of reference for the small grants because we wanted to extend it around Froome, but also to make sure that it incorporated all refugees. Um, We've also connected with the um, refugee communities in the outlying villages, and Dimitro has been working closely with the Norton St. Philip um, community. Um, and really working with um, local key providers, so working with Fair Froome, um, the Rotary Fair Housing for Froome, IT providers, community transport, and if I haven't named you, we've probably worked with you as well. Um, and also one of the big things is about supporting social and cultural opportunities. So since Arena has been in place, we've had people singing, people cooking, um, tree planting. We've had children going out to forest school. So really kind of embedding uh, our Ukrainian guests within a Froom community. Um, and the other thing is linking with Karis and the five other, or is it six other, five other um, hubs across Somerset. So that's the kind of work we are doing and it's ongoing. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nikki. And it is really lovely to see, it's really lovely to see how um, Irina's getting on in the job and, you know, just how flourishing some people are since they've been here. Uh, Peter, did you have a, a little bit briefly, quickly to add to that? No, great. No, seriously, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really. Um, I mean, only to say, um, I mean, to absolutely mirror what Nikki and, uh, and, and um, Clara say, I think the, the only bit I'd like to add is that this is not over, you know, and it's like, it's, e it's perhaps easy to think because, yes, people look well settled, many of them are working, many of them have got better English, settler. you know, it's a, it's a nightmare, isn't it, really, for these people, and when you talk to, I was talking to somebody the other day, it's like, I said, how are you, she said, fine, and then there's a pause, and then she said, actually, I'm really homesick. You know, and it's 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 a really weird demography, of course, because these are women and children and sometimes women and mothers, you know, so it's it's an, a, an odd thing. And the other thing I, I wanted to say in, in relation to the council, um, one of the things that I think is most difficult for them is the lack of they don't know what's going to happen next. And particularly in relation to housing, when we come in a moment to talk to the strategy, those sort of basic needs that people have, because the government has been sort of dribbling you know, yes, this is going to be help. Yes, but, you know, it may last six months. It may not. You know, there's a real need, I think, for the council to be pushing and lobbying and writing to MPs and so on, or part of that movement. So that, for instance, the post here is, you know, it's, it's a year. What happens? You know, these people will still be here. They're going to need help. And we'll need to get in really early in terms of trying to make sure that those resources can be continued. Um, so and that was the other thing I want to say. I mean, it's easy to think, I think partly, you know, people look all right when you see them, uh, you know, but it, this is this is really awful and it will continue to be awful, I think, for these people.
Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, all three of you, for the presentation and for all the work that you're doing. Any, yes, any, I was coming to that. Any quick questions or observations or comments, Polly? Yes, hi. Um, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Irina and Dimitra and have a, a good meeting with them and Nikki. Um, and we discussed housing in depth, um, partly because I'm um, director of Fair Housing for Froome. Um, now, um, one of the things that uh, that it came to light in that meeting was that you know Bristol, obviously a far larger and and uh, wealthier council than Mendip, for instance, um, it has a, a large package of help um, when they're looking for housing. Um, so if um, if if some uh, Ukrainians have been with their host families for six months, um, they uh, they might have to move on or they might they might be just looking for a little bit more independence. They're looking for private rental accommodation. Um, and some of them are working and supported by universal credit, etc. Um, but the problem being that uh, they can't go on the housing list because they don't have a local connection. As this is where I'm understanding it. If someone wants to correct me, that's fine. Um, but also um, they often can't find private rental because they don't have a guarantor. Bristol Council um, has stepped in to say that they would, you know, have a whole package ready to say that they will be a guarantor and, for instance, provide uh, furniture and uh, deposits. And these are the really big barriers, as we all know, you know, anyone who, who's private renting, um, uh, who's who obviously has a local support network, these people don't have that um, immediate uh, support network, apart from um, this sort of thing that, 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 that people kindly are putting together here. So they are relying on getting into a system that isn't really supporting them. Can we specifically request as Room Town Council, is anybody interested in supporting this, that, uh, that, that Mendip um, becomes, uh, offers being a guarantor or deposit scheme or something that can help them further get rented accommodation. So that's the next step because they can stay here for up to three years and that's a long time. Um, I can't speak for everybody, but I would assume that that'd be something that we'd be keen to look into as a council. Somerset, Somerset. yeah, going upwards, up, up the chain. Um, any quick comments or observations on that? Can we make a note of that, Paul? Is that something we can look into? Adam and then Anne. <coughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll need to speak to you at some point because I'm one of the... We'll look into it, I think. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've been recently trying to help a Syrian, a Syrian refugee family. They're, they're still here and sometimes yeah. they're still not settled in uh, many years. So it's yeah. very, housing being the main problem. And yeah, Mendip and, South, and Somerset. Uh, my question was going to be, well, what, what more can we do? Well, you've just come up with something. So thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and there might be um, a, a starting point that you can use for that, Adam, which is the um, help to rent scheme that Mendit run in conjunction with Mendit Community Credit Union. And I can't see why that couldn't be extended to help the refugees. OK. OK, brilliant. I'm going to move us on to the next agenda item because that's another quite weighty one. Uh, Max, I don't need to stress to you that we're already way behind on time way behind so if you could please keep it as tight as possible uh, this is to approve the council plan for 2022 to 24 so there's going to be action required um, from councillors at the end of this over to you max thank you so all of the councillors have been involved in is that all right that all of the councils have been involved in um, in creating a new plan for the for the for the for the town and for the council. So this really uh, is us getting together really and talking about what it is that we wanted to do, what we wanted to achieve um, over the term of this administration. So I'm going to take you through that. The document is clearly in the papers and it will be on the website. And we hope it's the beginning of a conversation, not the kind of end of one. But I'll take you through 
the things that we're trying to do. The way we put this together then, so we have spent a lot of time looking at the facts and figures of the town and the data and the evidence that we have, but also trying to blend that with local knowledge so that we're clear that we're addressing the things that the town really needs. Um, in the best traditions of independence for Froome, there's been a lot of diverse opinions, if you like, which we've tried to combine into a better outcome rather than to try and kind of argue each other out of things or shout each other down. We've wanted to really kind of combine those things and say, there's, what, what, what is it therefore that we can all agree on that we want to, that we want to do? I want to really say thank you to the staff who really helped us put this together from day one and have advised us on the, what I've put here, the feasibility, the deliverability, the affordability, the comparability, sometimes the legality uh, of our plans. Um, so very much thank you to them and they'll clearly be with us as we uh, endeavour to implement this through the work plan that we're devising with them. We've also tried to build into this, and you'll see in a second, that there are a number of areas that we're trying to look at, and that we've tried to kind of make certain certain people within the group responsible for those. So they, but they're not solely responsible, they essentially run a group uh, of both councillors and staff who then help to implement that. But if you want to become involved in the implementation of some of the things that we're talking about, then I'll give you the names of those people um, in a second. And it's really important, as it says there, that this is a gateway to greater participation. Um, you know, our absolute USP, you know, unique selling point um, as a council is our, our desire to involve all of the talent in the town, all of the capacity and capability in the town in putting some of these things into um, practice. And as you'll see, this is quite an ambitious plan. So actually everyone's involvement is very much welcome um, uh, in the endeavor. And you will see in a second that what we're trying to do, I know that as a parish council, we're only really responsible for the provision of very important allotments, but um, yeah, it's been the tradition of Froon Town Council for many, many years that we get involved in many other things. And as you will see that tradition, we want to continue in earnest. So next slide. Um, there are many themes from the previous strategy which continue, and so we're not going to talk through the whole thing tonight. We're going to talk through the really the, the new areas and the areas where we think there's been quite a significant change. So there's been quite a lot of changes, and one of the things that you will find is this is a two-year plan. Why? These are normally five-year plans, aren't they? And probably the work we're talking about will continue over a five-year period. But when we sat down to do this, what we really realized is that if you look at the last council administration, no one could have foreseen the, the, um, foreseen, um, the situation that we were faced with, you know, a pandemic, war in Europe, all of those, a cost of living crisis, all of those things. And so for us, um, we've tried to divide this therefore into two elements. So the first is really, what is it that we do to respond to the crisis that faces many people in Froome? Um, and there are three things that really come into that. So there is uh, urgent action needed on the reduction of poverty, um, and we've, we, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's also the need to protect community assets, many of which came under threat, in particular the football club, and we won't go into that tonight because people will know about it, but it is a massively important asset to the town. Partly, it was partly the, the pandemic really that threatened it, that brought its rather fragile existence into a kind of crisis point. So that's an, an area for us. And then the climate emergency that was declared whenever it was 2018 of course remains an emergency and we still need to have really really urgent action um, in relation to that so we'll talk about that in a second and hills is leading on poverty mel on the on the football club fiona on climate emergency but there are also some other more long-term things really where we're trying to say how do we shape the future of the town and this is longer term work it's not crisis work necessarily but it's work that we need to do things that we need to put in place so that we can create a more inclusive prosperous, sustainable, vibrant place. Um, and there are four things really there. So one is improving in planning and delivering affordable housing, which Steve Tanner's looking after. Agree a unitary deal, and that's a very particular wording, which I'll come to in a second, and that lies with me. Um, revitalizing our town centre sits with Nick, um, and nurturing open spaces sits with Mark. So again, if you want to be involved in the, that work, if you like, then do get in touch with those um, individuals. Um, what we want to talk about tonight then is just four things, so reducing poverty, responding to the climate emergency, agreeing a unitary deal, and improving and delivering affordable housing. So we're just going to cover those four areas and then uh, open it up to questions.
And I'm going to call upon colleagues as I go through this um, to just talk to what's on the screen. So I'm going to ask Anne to just talk a bit about poverty. Can I just stress again the need for brevity? It goes without saying it's anti-poverty. Um, so yes, we are aiming to tackle the cost of living crisis in the short term, as well as reducing as much as we can, um, the chronic long-term areas of deprivation in the town. So we met as a group of interested councillors. Um, we came up with four areas that we were um, aiming to look at. We then worked closely with Kate and her team, trying to find gaps in the provision in the town, as well as what the town is already doing, um, linking up those, uh, the, those, um, those areas of deprivation and the people working, organisations working within those areas, signposting the town um, to those organisations so, so far, we've got a leaflet out in the Froome Times. We're working on um, supporting people providing warm spaces, uh, working in the future on food provision and food security, and a little bit of uh, digital poverty as well. So working with Donate IT, um, helping the digitally excluded. What have I forgotten? And, and and other things as well. One of the things I would just call attention to is this bit in the middle, join together county council, NHS and community groups to create a help hub. There is a lot of conversation at the moment going on with the NHS within Somerset Council about the creation of a help hub in Froome. They all seem to be targeting different buildings, doing different things. So one of our absolute roles as a, as a, as a town council is to try and focus the effort of those big statutory agencies so that actually they create one place, not two different places or even three different places, doing one thing, not you know, anyway, you get, you, you get the idea. Okay, so that's great. Uh, the other last point I just wanted to make and support for the Refugee Hub is clearly part of all of that on the basis of the conversation we had in a second. What we want to do though, so, you know, there's a lot of support that which we're putting in, in crisis terms into things like, you know, warm banks and food banks and all of that. But actually, ultimately, that is not what we want people to live through that's no way for people to live so what we actually want to do in the end is to try and reduce reliance on those things and allow people to live independently and have the dignity uh, and the resources to be able to do that so that's really really important so thank you Anne. climate emergency fiona hi um sorry by the way about my voice i don't normally sound like this um so yeah so when max said we declared the climate emergency in 2018 we also committed as a town to um being net zero carbon by 2030 um but the reality is is that we're not going to be able to do that alone um, and our strategy really does reflect that and we will continue to support communities businesses individuals and other other organizations to support um, them to take action and enable them to make greener choices where they can as well. Um, unlike poverty, there was already um, a team in place at the Down Council we came in with a lot of really good work already in the pipeline. Um, so our strategy is sort of a combination of what they're already doing with a sort of a renewed focus on a couple of areas, which I will just sort of talk about, um, so which I'll sort of focus on. Um, so that's sort of what we're trying to achieve generally. All good things. Um, the one thing to highlight is that some of our work is dependent on getting funding from the Green and Healthy Froome Project, which is a partnership between Froome Town Council, Adventure and the Medical Practice, focusing on projects um, with co-benefits of climate and health and also money saving as well. Um, we're really excited about this. The bid is going in on Friday and we're going to be keeping our fingers crossed that we get the funding in the new year. Um, so in terms of sort of new bits, Max, you want to move on to the next one? We do. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that are sort of new. Um, the first one is the top one, um, a bit of work beginning to look sadly at what the effects of climate and ecological breakdown will be on our town and how we can begin to look at adapting and mitigating these. Um, obviously not something that we really want to include, but given where we're at, um, I think it's important to begin to look at that. Um, and then alongside the work that's already being done in active travel, biodiversity, energy and housing, we've sort of given a renewed emphasis um, to three areas, business, food resilience and circular economy. 
So with business, we're keen to look at how we can further support businesses to reduce their energy use and carbon footprint as industrial and commercial emissions form 29% of Foon's territorial carbon footprint at the moment. So we feel like there's a real area, there's a real area there for impact. Um, food resilience, as you've probably gathered from the um, comment about allotment, something I'm incredibly passionate about. And as everyone knows, our food comes to us by a very long and increasingly fragile chain. And we want to support people in Foom who are growing, producing and selling local products, um, as well as looking at the provision of growing spaces in and around town. Um, and finally, circular economy, um, again, looking to support people who are looking at how we can reduce, reuse, recycle more in Foom. So yeah, hope that makes sense. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Um, yeah, crack on, Max. Thanks. Um, statistic that we put up earlier on in the year: you're on seventy households in Froome in need of a house. Um, simple fact: there is a desperate shortage of affordable housing in Froome. Um, it's something that we are looking to try. Uh, as best we can, um, do something about. Um, do you want us to flick on, Max? Um, we will ensure developments um, provide the right type of number. We know it's one and two bedrooms. All, this, all the stats give us that. Um, that's what we'll be talking to um, developers about. Um, but they've got to suit the needs of, uh, of, of the people here in the, in the town, but also embrace um, you know, climate emergency, climate declaration as well. So, we, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a tough sort of uh, course to navigate, but um, we'll give it a best shot. Um, we know the overall percentage of social and affordable houses currently standing at around 21%, even though there is a, a minimum of 30. Developers have used all kinds of tricks to... Um, um, to not build affordable housing going forward, it's going to be a real red line for us. Um, we are um, putting together a supplementary planning document, um, which we will give to developers as soon as they come through the door. And if they don't reach thirty, then we don't really know, not really interested. Um, aspirational, we'd like to get up to forty, and uh, there are um, discussions going on at the moment between um, some district councils as well because uh, we know Wales has got 40, so we want to see how they got to 40 and see if we can do the same here. Um, um, success will be developments that the town can be proud of, not that the developers make huge amounts of profit on. Um, that's the long and short of it. Um, what will we do? Um, we will keep talking to developers. Um, make no, no excuse for that, because we have found that by talking to developers, by telling them what we want, we actually get results just by, by not talking to them. They just go ahead and build what they want and what makes more money for them. So we will keep talking to developers. This doesn't mean to say we're going to agree with them all the time, but we will keep talking to them. Um, supplementary planning document I've just mentioned. Uh, I'll be working on that with the rest of the council and, and with Jane. Um, we still want to bring together a cross board section of community. I should a paper about this in, uh, with, with, with Mel's help in, um, in August. We are still going to do that. Uh, we're hoping to do that um, early next year. Things have got in the way. Um, a couple of large developments that are coming up, which has um, sort of taken our attention, but that is still the plan to talk to the whole town to get a broad cross section of the community together. Um, and um, it's a shame the parking people aren't here because they would have enjoyed the next one. Um, we do want to um, put together a comprehensive transport and parking strategy. This has been talked about for years, I mean, for donkey's years, but. Um, with the new unitary coming through, we do actually want to, um, you know, try and get something on transport and parking. It goes hand in hand. So see if we can do that. Won't happen overnight. And finally, we do want to work with the unitary to improve enforcement. Um, keep developers on track. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Steve's mentioned unitary. So we're going to finish on unitary. Mike's and this comes back. Yes, that comes back. So we're going to finish on Unitary. And um, this is a sort of uh, an area of kind of huge uh, debate um, uh, kind of amongst people in the group. I think um, I could probably look, win, win some plaudits for just standing here and slagging off Mendiv and slagging off Somerset and talking about localism and people's commitment to localism. And I'm sure we could get all very fired up um, by this. But I do think 
I do think that probably some of the acrimony that has existed in previous years between us as a council and other councils have probably really disadvantaged Froome in the end. And so we do want at least to try to reset that relationship and to try and create one which is much, much more productive and much more cooperative. Um, and is essentially based on a kind of, what I've talked about here, a win-win for both of us. And actually, if you look across the country, uh, all of the devolution deals that have been done, they all have mutual benefit at their core. So any local government officer evaluating any proposition from Froome would have to invoke what's called the duty of best value. In other words, they would have to say, is it worth it? Does it give advantage? And so I think from our point of view, we're not just localists. We don't just think that localism is a better thing ideologically. We actually think we can prove that we can do things better and consequently create a, an agreement with the unitary which both suits Froome and suits Somerset Council. So I just want to describe early thinking, I guess, is the best way to describe it in, in all of this. And we want to try and bring together three kind of quite key things. The first off, the first of them, and this is going to sound a bit weird, is I'm going to start by thinking about the plight bluntly of the county council. There are numerous things which are on its um, radar, if you like. Um, so the first thing that we hear um, is that the, the, the amount of savings that that council will have to deliver within its first term are, I think the phrase eye-watering is around quite a lot at the moment, and I think they sound like they will be um, eye-watering. So there is no doubt that the council is not going to be giving away assets to people on, on, on even a neutral cost basis. It will certainly need, I would imagine, that they would want to see advantage in uh, giving any of those assets away. So I've put there our uh, £80 million funding gap, and I kind of think it may even be more than that. We're also aware that they are only just out of special measures in many of its children's services. And we're also aware of the fact that it faces a demographic time bomb in relation to the older population. And I think to the point where they almost just stop counting what that might give them um, in, in years to come. So my point here is that we have to start from a place where we have to say, actually, if we don't help them address those things, and actually that disadvantages both the wider county and indeed the town of Froome. So there are two bits which we think we could really make um, a difference in. So the first is, um, and this is really to do with the assets that we think we could make a better job of. And for us, therefore, if you look at what's currently known or currently described as the cultural quarter in Froome, so those are all of those assets that exist around the market yard car park, the cheese and grain, um, the library, all of those, all of those assets, if you like, and as well as the, the, the kind of really unexplored and unexploited riverfront um, in that particular area, then we think by controlling those assets, not necessarily owning them, we could really do something to kind of build the cultural quarter and the cultural offer of the town. And we think that could then lead to greater economic growth in that rather neglected area of the town centre. When it comes to somewhere like the car park, and we're not mad about this, we don't think county council are about to give us the revenue from it. And actually, I don't really think we want the revenue from it. What we want is the capacity to be able to control activity within it so that we can talk about when, to, when people get charged, when people don't get charged, and from that create a much more economically successful area. It's what the town's been talking about for a very long time. Let's leap over to the other side. The other thing that we have become very famous for is some of the work that we do around early health and prevention, the stuff that we do through Active and In Touch, the stuff that we do with the medical centre has, of course, really done a lot to combat isolation of older people. So we think we have some of the beginnings of a solution to some of that demographic time bomb around older people that we were talking about earlier on. So really by expanding, and if we look at the work of the local community network, we're also then trying to develop a much more comprehensive early help offer. Because one of the things that has happened in previous years is as money has become tighter, the, council, the county council has cut back on all of that preventative activity. We think we're in a position to be able to pick that up and to do that and to attract additional funding for that and to do that better. So if you put those two things together, greater economic growth, better early help, then we're in a position then, I think, to do something which is really good for Froome, but also really benefits the position that the county council is in. And consequently, 
he hopes, herald a new, a new age, if you like, or a new era of, uh, of, of cooperation between us. So that's the, the agreement, if you like, that we want to reach with Somerset County. We're aware that the Glastonbury Town deal tries to deal with many of the same things. So we want to really take that and grow that idea, if you like, consult people within the town, grow momentum for that, um, and then try and make that agreement with the county. And I think the, you know, the target date would probably be somewhere around April, April 2024. But there's lots to be done. But that's, that's the approach we really want to take to Unitary. Don't just give us assets for the sake of it. Let's do it because we actually think we can create mutual advantage from it. And the final thing to say is, um, yeah, so we've said all this. Um, so that's, that's the work we want to do. The final thing to say then is we, in the, part of the Unitary thing is, you know, people will say, well, what do we want to grow then as a town council? Do we want to take on more areas of responsibility? So I think I've tried to indicate the areas of activity that we want to take on, but we don't want to just grow as an organisation. We don't want to become Salisbury or Chippenham or any of those kind of places who take on an awful lot of service provision activity because if you look at our whole strategy, it really de de depends on us being advocates and champions for the town, conveners and coordinators of other public sector activities so that people can be really focused on the real issues here um, signposting and guiding people to other provision which is just some of the stuff that we've talked about in relation to early help and refugees we're catalysts and supporters so we try and accelerate things and make things happen that's an awful lot of the work we've done on climate change has really been about that establish a principle and then try and accelerate it within the town and then finally we're challenges innovators sometimes providers and managers but almost as last resort so that's our strategy those are the things that we want to do um it's on the website as i say if people want to get involved do contact the leads but um i don't know i commend it to the house <laughs> i commend it to the house actually before we commend it to the house thanks max for uh, swimming through it so swiftly i uh, are there any very very quick observations or comments peter then anita I mind a very quick comment. Um, this is a it's, a it's a really important moment, this, in the sense that this is this council taking over because you've had to live with, uh, you know, not had to live with, you know, you've inherited. And, I, and I, so I read this on the train. I came back from Sheffield this afternoon, read it on the train. And I think it's, uh, it, it, it reads beautifully and it makes a lot of sense. And I, I thoroughly commend it to the House. I think it's great. Well done. Thank you. That matters. Thank you, Peter. Anita. Thank you. Um, thank you, Max. Uh, and I know everybody within the uh, councillor body has actually contributed uh, to this document. Um, and, and thank you to everybody who's done that. But particular thanks to you, Max, really, for coordinating all this information, for putting the slides together and for spearheading this effort. So just thanks to everyone, but particularly to you. Echo. Thanks, Anita. Can I have... Well done. I'm so pleased you are even quicker than time. Um, can I have a proposal to take this, uh, to ratify this? Anne Hills, yes, seconded by Anita. Uh, all those in favour of commending it to the House? Looks unanimous to me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have another fairly hefty um, uh, thing to approve. This is on Broadway Community Gardens. Again, I shall stress, I'm prepared to now another 15 minutes onto the meeting, so we should be okay if you're tight yeah, on your time. We will keep it quick, but I mean, Carl and I have been working on this for six months, but these guys have been working towards this moment for five years. So we're going to take our 15 minutes. Well, they're going to take the 15 minutes. Um, so I'm Fiona, I'm Foomtown Councillor um, for Oakfield Ward, which is where Broadway Community Gardens is situated. I think this is a really unique piece of land in Foom and there's a very unique vision of how it could be used to the benefit of the whole town. Um, so tonight we're proposing that Foomtown Council buys the land from Mendip District Council for £25,000 plus our legal fees, with SOS Foom having provisionally agreed to reimburse half that amount on the understanding that will be transferred to them at some point next year to be held going forward by the community. Um, Andy Jones, uh, town councillor, but also on the board of SOS, will speak a little bit later about that. Hi, I'm Carla, also a councillor for Oakfield Ward. Um, so just to kind of emphasize the timing of this. So this, this is like a moment in time. There's a window of opportunity here. Mendip District Council disappears in April. And as Max pointed out, um, the assets owned then by Unitary, who knows what will happen? So if we don't buy this land now, this will transfer to Unitary who have a massive debt and will not be giving anything away. So we need to move this through now in order for this to be 
bought by April. Um, so I know this land, I live, I live near this land, I know these people, I know how much hard work they've put in. So um, let's pass over to them. So they are the Broadway Community Gardens and Allotment. Um, so we'll be working with them to realize the vision. Um, we'll be engaging with not just the local residents, but also the town. So this is going to be a community wide asset. It's not just going to be for the people of Oakford Ward or for the people near Broadway. Um, just to really make that clear. Okay, so I'm going to pass over to you. Was that brief enough? That was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Next test. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I did really well earlier on my comment, actually. Thank you, John. I didn't, I impressed myself. <laughs> um, so for those who don't know, I'm John Clark, and I'm chair of the Baltway Allotment and Community Garden Association. Uh, and I have Julian, who's our treasurer, and Jenny, who's a member of our committee, a local resident. So um, uh, I, I just want to say thank you to Carla and um, uh, Fiona for their help and support over the last six months. It's been invaluable uh, in trying and moving this forward. And it is very exciting that we have reached a moment where we can make a decision and actually achieve something we've been working towards the last five years. Um, so this is a very brief history. Um, because I suspect most of you know about it. So five years ago, I brought a small group of local people together and we started to talk about saying what we later described as Froome's last undeveloped green space. And I noticed in your, your council plan how you have the aspiration of nurturing, nurturing open spaces and this hopefully is one of them. Um, so our, and we then formed the association about three and a half years ago. And the main focus has been to campaign and save and promote the space as a community asset. Um, and with the help of Polly Copeland, uh, we've developed our vision for the site. Um, and we also have since then encouraged people to use the site for growing food. We've had other activities which Julian and Jenny will talk about. Um, so uh, I also just want to take this opportunity to thank Julian and Jenny and Ali Nelson, our secretary, who can't be here tonight, uh, Sue Sadler, Polly, and Iga Ingo Copeland for all their help and support over the last five years. Um, and so we are really pleased that Mendip have finally recognised the need to save this space and, to, and the asset it can be for the town in terms of a community space. And I'll give in the town council this opportunity, this window, if you like, to, to um, purchase the site and work with Save Open Spaces to create something really special. Um, there's a slide, I think, which should be coming, which will show our vision. And let me be absolutely clear here. This is our vision, which we drew up some time ago, which was part of our campaign. And it gives you a sense of what we would like to see, but it's not set in stone. We believe very firmly, and I believe very firmly, and I've learned my lesson, perhaps, around consultation. So hopefully uh, we'll, I will make sure it's done properly next time. And you might know what that's a reference to. So, um, so we, it is very much making this a community asset for the benefit of the whole community. Um, and through talking with the local community and all aspects of our community about that, um, it's going to be community focused. Um, and I think that the time is um, very important in terms of climate now that we build strong communities who are sharing skills uh, and we want to provide a site which does that. Uh, as you can see, we're looking at allotments. The importance here is about people growing and sharing food. It's really essential that people start to think about how we can be resilient communities. And part of that is growing our food locally as much as you can um, and, and doing what we can to share those skills and share those food. Uh, food. Uh, and it, we want to create a place which it, where nature is nurtured um, and where people... Uh, can respect and share the benefits of nature. We know through the pandemic, one of the things we learned was in terms of people's well-being and mental health, nature and open spaces is crucial in helping people maintain their well-being and improve their, their mental health and well-being. So this is the, a sort of space that we want to see the opportunity to do that with people. Um, so it is going to be, we believe and hope to be a multi-purpose community asset for the benefit of all, uh, multi-generational, uh, for organizations, for schools. We've had interest in the past from various organizations who want to have sort of space, and Julian will talk about that to some extent. And as I said, we recognize the importance of engaging with the local community and genuine consultation and listen to what the community wants to see 
And it may be based around that, it might be totally different. So this is just a very starting point. So I hope you will vote in favor of the proposal. Um, I'd be uh, extremely happy if you do, and there may even be a, a bottle of carver somewhere, or champagne even, oh. um, so for some, but not for others. Uh, who depends on the outcome of the vote, of course, but no, I'm sure you would want to vote with your heart in terms of creating something really unique and special for, town, for the town of Foon. Thank you very much. I'll hand over Thank to you, John. You. Thank you, John. Oh, good evening. So we were briefed that we had a very short window of time to talk to you this evening. So what we've done, we've put together a couple of slides illustrating activities that have taken place on the site and groups that have been using the site, but more really to show what our aspirations are and where we see the site going. So we've got a couple of um, litter picks. We've got some dig days where the community comes together and, as you can see, all the generations mucking in uh, and creating beds, etc. Uh, we've got some child mining groups and we've got young and old hard at work on the site. Um, Jenny, did you want to talk to the second slide? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to say that this has become a really much loved space by everyone. Um, yeah, we've created a, we're hoping to be an educational area. We've already had a couple of work, gardening workshops um, and we'd love to have some yoga and Tai Chi community led groups there. Um, and I just I think it would just be amazing for all roads to have a community garden. Now, the amount of neighbours that we know now, you know, so many of us, we didn't know each other. And it's just been a really, really lovely space to, for, that everyone enjoys. And the wildlife is just amazing there. You know, you just go out there and you just see all the birds and the slow worms, there's bats. It's just so much. It's amazing. <laughs> Bringing a tear to my eye. Um, did you want to say something, Andy? So with my SOS room hat on, just to reassure this room that uh, at the board meeting on Monday evening, uh, the uh, the board of SOS room were very supportive of uh, this proposal. We've been looking to acquire additional green spaces uh, around Froome for some time, and this is a, an ideal site for us to uh, extend that town ownership of, uh, of its green assets. Um, Bob, do you want to say something? Uh, hi, uh, some of you may not know me. I'm new in post, so Rob Holden, Environment Manager. Um, brilliant to be involved in this amazing project, which has um, brought uh, so many people together with such passion and enthusiasm. Um, really, I, all, the only thing I want to add is that the timeline is tight. We've heard about Mendip District Council, um, what, would, what could happen if it was passed to the unitary authority. Uh, so all I need to say really is that this is a deal that actually can happen, definitely can happen. The heads of terms are agreed and subject to the vote happening tonight, um, uh, it can quickly move to solicitors becoming involved and the transaction happening. The, I, the idea is that that could happen by as early as January. And so that the transfer actually comes to Froome uh, before Mendip District Council ceases to exist. And that's the title deed. So if, if the vote goes ahead, this is what Froome Town Council and ultimately SOS uh, would own. Um, there's various other technicalities if anyone's got any questions, but just about to say amazing work, everybody. Are there any quick questions? Adam and then Nick. Yeah. And then I've got a statement to be read out from Helen's Bross and White. It, it was just to refer to that statement. If you're going to do okay. that, that's great. It's going to do that in a sec. Nick. It looks lovely. I walked around there yesterday. Um, Froome has something called the Froome Area Community Land Trust, which was formed in 2019. John knows this well. Um, they've yet to find any land to build affordable housing on. And I love the idea. I love the images. I love the picture. But actually, you know, we've heard from the um, Ukrainian refugee problem. We've heard, we are absolutely desperate for land for housing. And um, I find it really hard to reconcile. Even our strategy, we talk about the competing things. You know, we've got Steve's um, talk about housing. We've got Mark's work with open spaces. Um, I, I just find it really hard to support the idea that we will buy land, 
that for all the wonderful vision of everyone having access to it, we know that won't be the case. There will be the people who live around it, generally who go there. And I won't support this. I know I'm in a minority of this. I love it. I love the community work. I love the whole network side of it. But I just have to say, I feel that we as a council have got to be braver and bolder and put people before bloody badgers that get run over when they come into the town centre. Um, can I just answer that? I don't think it's either or. I think that um, there is real value to this space as a community asset. I think it's not the right space for affordable housing. And I'm really committed to us working with faculty and trying to find space for affordable housing. But it is not the space. The access is not good enough. It's a very tight space. There are issues around, um, you know, with the ransom strips, etc. It has been looked at, I think. And I think that had it been a viable site for that, then we wouldn't be able to buy it from Mendip. Is the truth. Yeah, John, do you want to answer that? Um, I have every sympathy for what Nick is saying. As, as, I'm, as, I, as he said, I'm, I'm a member of the board of FOOM, uh, the Community Land Trust, and we're looking for land to build affordable housing. And as uh, Fiona says, it, it's not one or the other. We have to balance the two. Um, we have to find land. We have to find space for people. You know, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about Silver Garden community, you know, but that could offer a large number of affordable housing for people. This is a space, and let's be frank, Yes, Mendip are saying they recognise it's it can be a community asset and they're offering the opportunity to do that. But they have, I believe, looked into viability around development and found that it's not viable for a number of reasons. I don't believe, despite our campaign, they may well have gone the other way. I think our campaign helped edge, edge it, if you like, towards them saying, yes, you can buy it. So, yeah, I've every sympathy with your view, Nick. I fully support it, but it's not one or the other. It's found in the balance. Thank you. Can I just go back on the point about it? It will be a space, like we are very, very firm. It will be a space for everyone. We're going to improve the access. And we've already spoken with all the licensee holders around the outside. We've done lots of consultation and we have been red line firm. Their licenses are going, they're going to get a letter, a formal letter in the next few days for sending their license. It will be a space for everyone. And we're very, very committed to that. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, last thing before we vote is Sorry. a statement from Helen Sporson White. I also want to respond to that. Just that filling every single small green space in our town is not going to solve the housing crisis. So you could probably build six, 17 houses there. So you could, you know, you could look at the town and look at where are the tiny little green spaces and kind of infill them with two here, three here. That's not going to solve the housing crisis. And what we'll lose is our green spaces, spaces to breathe, spaces to relax, spaces to grow, spaces to be with community. So I'd like to try and change your mind, Nick. <laughs> um, this is not, we all, we're all in agreement with that. And there are other solutions that, you know, we've, we've heard from Steve that, um, that are going to be closer to housing the, um, solving the housing crisis, but filling in every single green space is not it. Thank you. Very final point. I know for a fact that people come across town to go to Victoria Park because I've done had discussions with people there about that. And they're going to come across town to come and visit this site as well. And I will make sure or we will make sure that happens. I'm sure you will. OK. Helen Sprawson White has to say. Yeah, uh, Councillor Helen Sprawson White, who's the Mendip councillor for Oakfield Ward. Um, apologies that she can't make it tonight. She's asked me to read this out. Um, to, to like to thank from town council for bringing uh, Broadway alumnus to the agenda. Uh, she says in 2007, she was first elected as to the town council. And from day one, she's tried to, uh, and fought to protect this space for the community. Uh, she, she, we, she says, we saved it from development when the old police station was demolished. And it's been fantastic to see the community using the space in recent years. Uh, it's been extremely hard work to get discussion to this point, working between the authorities and through different administrators, administrations and cabinet members. But we're finally at a point where we have an opportunity to transfer the land to FTC for community use permanently. Helen says she'd like to thank councillors and officers, both Mendip and Froomtown Council, for getting us to this point and uh, would implore Froomtown Council to agree to the terms uh, on the agenda this evening. Finally, after 15 years of my trying and communities been battling to protect this site and it's, uh, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, is wildlife and the town will have another important green space safely preserved for its residents. Thank you. I'm going to go to the vote. So can I have somebody to propose? 
please, Max, and to second um, me, and then everyone else, everyone in favour? Majority. Uh, and Easily. Is voting against. Are you actually voting against or abstaining? <laughs> Anyone against? Yes. As that's okay, so she's she's she doesn't get a vote on this one, but it was still quorum, so that's fine. So that's the majority. Was that a majority? Well done, team. Ne 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 ne. Okay, we've got a final few quick items on the agenda. Um, we have to vote now, point seven, ratification of round two of the community grants applications. And this is being led by, oh, oh, any questions on it, on them, on the last grants, on the last funding round? Yes, Fiona. Sorry, I'm trying to get my head together. Um, a couple of things. First of all, who is on the grants committee currently? Because I don't know. Um, then there was an error in the thing. It said that they were sufficiently evidenced, I think, when it should have been insufficiently evidenced. Um, on that was on the music miniature thing. And then on Mojo Moves, I just want to understand the Grants Committee um, reasoning on why they're not paying for salaries. Because I think, I don't know, to me, it feels that we should be paying for people and supporting people, to me, feels quite legitimate. Any answers? So what's the question? Who's on it? Who is on it? it? I just don't know. Steve, Mark, Phil, Carla, and Andy. Okay, so is there what is what was that? Was there an actual question within that? But not paying one of the reasons for refusing one was not paying for salaries, and I just wanted to hear what the reasoning was. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So the Mojo Moves application was for her to do her job, wasn't it? For, for her to have her salary to do her job, I believe. Is there, does anyone know why that one didn't get accepted? Um, we, the um, decision around that one was more that they wanted well, from discussion in the group was that they would have rather have seen subsidised access. So for people that might have struggled to uh, perhaps pay entry fees or something, um, they have been very supportive of Mojo Moves in the past. They have received a number of grants from the town council. And actually in this instance, they would have rather have seen an application that would have helped more people access what they were offering rather than our money just propping them up in, in, that, in that way. Can I, I cannot tell from a different angle maybe. Good. So one of the reasons of, of giving the grants is to help community groups to start up. Um, so when we see the same community groups coming back every time, then we have a concern around how financially sustainable that community group is. Um, and Mojo Moves was, is one of them, was one of them. So that in this instance, that was why, as well as what Laura has mentioned. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, point, uh, oh, so we need to vote on that, do we? Yeah, we need to, um, can someone um, approve ratification of round two of the community grants? Mark, can someone second? Steve, can everyone else raise to approve? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, item eight, approving a replacement member of the planning committee and ratifying a change to the start time of meetings. I think Steve, this is, oh, Jane, 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 okay. I'll be quick, okay. Thank you. Uh, so in July of this year, the, um, the membership of the planning committee was agreed um, and now councillor Tracy Ashford would like to stand down from the planning committee. Um, in line with standing orders, we require at least six councillors to be on the planning committee and um, therefore we require a nomination for at least one more councillor to join the planning committee. And secondly, um, at our last meeting, the planning committee agreed that 
sorry, I've lost my place, um, <laughs> um, that planning committee meetings to have an earlier start time of 6.30, with the option of later starts of 7pm for larger meetings, and that all the start times will be published on the agenda in advance of the upcoming meeting. Um, so the recommendations are there on the screen to receive nominations for councillors to become members of a planning committee and to appoint at least one. Do you want to do them separately? Um, yes. I guess so. Can can somebody? Um, what's the word? <laughs> Put their red thing up uh, to to receive nominations for councillors to become members of the planning committee and to appoint at least one of those. Nick to second. You need you need to nominate somebody. Oh, sorry, you need to nominate. <laughs> so is there somebody to be nominated? Well, can I speak? So I've said that I, I can do it if no one else does, but I think it's clear that I am across a lot of things now. I don't think that's particularly good. It's okay and I'm fine, but I don't think it's particularly good to take up this much space as a councillor. So if anyone else wants to, please do. But if not, I will. I can do it. Go Does on. anyone else want to go on the planning committee? Go on, somebody must want to. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, so who's, if it's just Fiona at this stage, who's going to propose Fiona? Um, <laughs> and he got his red thing up first. And seconding Fiona. Everyone in favour of Fiona, say aye. <laughs> Everyone not in favour of Fiona. <laughs> Speak. I don't think I don't, I don't really agree with this process. So um, Fiona has said that she will do it if no one else will do it. She's recognised that she's spread thinly. I think we, us count seventeen councillors, all know that. Probably the staff know that as well. Um, so I don't like just being at a kind of de facto forcing her hand in a sense. Um, what's the reason of needing so many councillors? Um, why aren't other councillors standing forward? Is, is it because it's too much ask? Yeah, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with the way the decision's being made. Uh, so it's because our standing orders um, state the amount, the minimum amount of councillors that are required. Um, I don't know why nobody else wants to do it. You know, it's just, <laughs> can, it's, it's just a matter of time. I would love to do it. I've tried to be on the planning com committee for the last four years, but it's just one of those things that just not been able to factor in the time is is there anyone else that at least want to speak lisa yeah all those in favor of lisa <laughs> right um i don't i don't know if that would work would it no it has to be a Freemtown councillor lisa I want to second what Carla's saying. Fiona throws herself into the breach time and time again. Um, and, and I think that's hugely valuable. Um, but I don't think that it should be her hand forced into, into doing that. Um, the football club should ease up and there should be some space. I'm happy to, to step into the breach. I've got a suggestion, but I want to hear Nick first. Can't we change standing orders? Yes, it was going to be the suggestion. Right. We could change the standing orders so we don't have that as a, so we just have one less, one fewer. Can we do that? My experience smaller that. groups are much better anyway. Yes, Martin. I think it would be a tremendous mistake to reduce the size of your planning committee. With, um, with the area regional planning boards, you want as much representation on future planning issues as you can possibly get, and you'll undermine yourself if you only have five people on it. Point taken. Did you propose yourself, Lisa? No, you... <laughs> no, it's not. No, you can. Just... Okay, Max is, propo Max is proposing, Lisa. Carla seconding. Carla. Andy, oh my God! <laughs> Jane, <laughs> that's for Paul. The, the the 
the, the point of standing orders are create the rules of the game. Uh, however, council has the prerogative to change standing order if it wants to. Holly, is it is it possible that? Um, I mean, we, we we really need to change this tonight. We really need to do it quickly. Um, could we have it that 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 Fiona stands in for now for a temporary basis, and we bring it up again at another meeting, it, it, just to relieve her because she's prepared to stand in on a temporary basis, or but she knows she's busy. Is it possible to bring it up at a further meeting? It it possibly is. What about Lisa standing though? Is that not realistic? Lisa, sorry, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Just saying that if if neither of them are particularly wanted to do it, they could try it out, and we could bring it up again at another meeting. So volunteering is a strange way to Okay, let's try that process again. Could we nom nominate both and they could almost take it in turns if one's, it gives a bit more flexibility? Both be on the committee the, and then the committee gives, make, it's easier to make it quiet that way. No, no. <laughs> Fiona, no. no. Let's go with. Uh, uh, I'm really sorry, everyone. Uh, the stand. The evening meetings, Fiona, hang on, hang on children, on it's fine. Like, I'm not, like, I wouldn't have offered if I wouldn't, but I think the idea of us sharing is fine. It, it's not about sharing. It, it, there's a minimum number of six councillors. It can be seven, and we have two proposals, and that would make seven. That's that's the end of it, isn't it? Okay. So how about we have seven on the committee, and then one of you's not there, then one of you's not there. Right. So can I have somebody to propose Lisa and Fiona on the committee? Polly, someone to second. Mark, everyone raise their reds for Fiona and Lisa joining the planning committee. Okay, problem solved. And was there anything else from you, Jane? I think Jane's got something. Yeah, uh, yes. Merp, quiet, please. Oh, thank you for that. It's really not that bad, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, and the second part is to approve the proposed change to the start of the planning committee to 6.30 and amend standing orders and the meeting calendar accordingly. Yeah, proposer, please, Steve, seconder, Max, all those in favour. Yes. Yes, happy happies. Thank you very much. And now, very, very finally, are there any questions for Sarah on the financial position? I don't think she's going to go through it in a great amount of detail unless there's anything uh, specific that you need to say. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah? John, don't you dare. <laughs> on that note, then, thank you. Well, 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 item nine, recommend. Yes, we've got to. Um, um, yeah, okay, so we've got to note the external auditor's report and signed certificate of Froome Town Council's, what's that? That one, 2021-22. Um, so everyone can read that. Can I have somebody to propose that we accept that to approve that? Anita and somebody to second. Andy Rintmore. And Red's high. And on that note, thank you. It's been an a, a, a interesting meeting this evening, full of uh, lots of emotions and uh, some interesting conversations. Thank you very much, Anita. See you all next month.